I had to see the film, watched it, was horrified. It stuck in my mind, have no interest in revisiting it, and it left quite an impression. Can you name a movie that is absolutely incredible, not Star Wars, that you've seen over a dozen times? Oh, well, let's see. Um, uh, a movie that I've seen over a dozen times that is a movie that also I come back to to kind of renew my faith in movies is Blade Runner. I think uh, by Ridley Scott, uh, the world building in Blade Runner, the uh, sci-fi film noir, um, you know, Harrison Ford's performance, very unlike how we knew Harrison Ford when he played Han Solo. And I think that that film has been incredibly influential, not just with other movies, other dystopian films, because dystopian films of that era didn't necessarily take themselves too seriously. You know, they were um, borderline like sci-fi adventure comedies. But, um, you know, Blade Runner is a classic. And it, it has, you know, it's, it's influential till today, not just in movies, but also in video games and in design. And it's funny, you know, it's, it's really funny looking at how forward thinking Blade Runner is in the sense that, okay, we don't have flying cars, but we, we do have many of the things that are in Blade Runner. Like LA has become very multicultural, much more than uh, the time in which it was made. So that's a movie I can just put on any time and watch. Yeah, and I think Philip K. Dick talked about um, that he envisioned a world where the higher social strata would live up top and, and as people's income and sort of like place in society, yeah, they would it, be more toward the bottom. I mean, Blade Runner in a way kind of predicted the uh, economic divide that we're currently experiencing with more and more people being pushed from the middle class um, to lower middle class or worse, and a huge divide between the elites and everybody else. And it's, it's unfortunate, but that, that movie, that's, that's an element of Blade Runner. Can you tell us about the movies that we want to watch over and over again versus the movies we just wanna see one time? Maybe they were satisfying enough, but we're good, one and done. I think that the movies that we watch over and over again, uh, we're seeking one, comfort food. It's a film I'm familiar with. 2001 A Space Odyssey is a movie that I'll watch several times a year. And if it's at a retrospective screening, I'll be sitting in a perfect spot in the theater for that movie. But I think we're seeking some kind of meaning. And I will say with the films that I do repeatedly view, they're ones that I saw at probably a, an impressionable age, but also I'm looking at it differently. So it's interesting to see a film I saw when I was, say, 11 years old, like Logan's Run, okay? And then I see it differently now as an adult. Uh, and, and so that's, what's, that's what, I, what I find fascinating about films that we watch on repeat or will have repeated viewings at different phases of life because it's in some way kind of a reflection of us. And, and so th those films for me are, you know, movies like a Logan's Run or a, a 2001 A Space Odyssey or Tron. And, and it's funny that those movies, perhaps with the exception of Logan's Run, are still remembered. Um, I think Logan's Run is more revered for the performances of Michael York and Jenny Agutter than, than the actual special effects. Your mileage may vary on the special effects for that film. But 2001 holds up to today. And I don't think that we would have had a Star Wars or a George Lucas if Stanley Kubrick had not made 2001. Because 2001 A Space Odyssey, the special effects from that film actually directly influenced George Lucas. He thought, well, now I can make a science fiction film with spaceships and laser guns, but I, I want it to be taken seriously. I don't want it to be a joke. But those those films we, we, we revisit, we're trying to revisit, I think, I think it's a reflection of us now, and that's also revisiting perhaps who you were when that movie made an impression. So I think of myself as a kid being dropped off at the movie theater in Michigan 
by my mom to go see Logan's Run, which was PG and probably shouldn't been. There's an ample amount of nudity and, and deeper themes in that film. Um, but but that, that is a film that resonates for me today that you could hardly convince anyone now to watch it because it definitely feels, the special effects are dated for sure. But I don't know that you'll find a better romance in a, in a science fiction film than Logan's Run. So I kind of, I kind of revisit that film. It was, you know, um, seeing that, you know, by myself, seeing it in a theater a couple times after that, um, when it came to the dollar theater. And then also kind of was my first interest in, in you know, I, I was a young boy, I liked girls. And so that movie was a romance. And uh, so, yeah, it reminds me of just being a kid and that was sort of my first interest in girls was, was seeing Logan's Run, oddly. What's interesting when you when we rewatch a movie, let's say like Kramer versus Kramer, mm -hmm. which I probably saw way too young, but I thought it was so funny. Mm -hmm. But now, as an adult, you watch it and it's it's very sad. It's it's yeah, Kramer versus Kramer is heartbreaking. It's not. Um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, you know moments of levity for sure, right? A lot, but but there are, there's so much more going on. I do think that that era in the '70s and even like partially into the 80s, was such a great era of American filmmaking. You know, I, I, I tell people revisit those films. That was when there was less, far less studio influence. Studios, in fact, didn't really know what to do. You know, the marketing in particular uh, wasn't as sophisticated as it is now or as controlled. And I mean that in a good way. Uh, go back and watch the original trailers for any movie from the 70s. They didn't know how to make a movie trailer back then. Or at least they didn't have the sort of very traditional kind of trailery things that we see, the, the voiceover, the certain, certain types of musical notes and themes that are overused quite a bit. And, you know, um, you, you, you can look up videos on this. There, there are so many so many ways that they test these trailers because they're tracking emotion. There's certain emotions and beats that they want to hit. In addition to basically ruining most of the movie up until potentially the third act. And if you're familiar with the genre, you can probably figure out what's going to happen. It's rare I see a trailer these days for a studio movie that doesn't completely ruin the entire film. Is that theater still there in Michigan? Uh, I don't believe it is. Unfortunately, it was... Uh, the Berkeley Theater was turned into a drugstore. But the Berkeley Theater was walking distance, or at least bicycle distance from my house, and I would go see movies every week at that theater. It was because it was only a dollar. And there was a drugstore directly next door where I bought comic books. Can you name a movie that was absolutely incredible to watch, but you've only seen it one time? Uh, yes. And I'm sad to tell you it was The Human Centipede. Uh, there, there was, if you know anything about the story of the human centipede, it's absolutely horrific and I'm not going to describe it for you. Um, do your research at your peril. But that's a film I saw once because I had to see it. Um, and I, I did review it for a, a, a job at the time. I was doing movie reviews on, on G4 TV and I... Had to see the film, watched it, was horrified. It stuck in my mind, have no interest in revisiting it, and it left quite an impression. Um, but normally movies I only see once, I only see them once for a reason, and that's because they're not very good. <laughs> and I don't wish to revisit them. Um, Human Centipede, I thought, just the concept of it, it's, it's horrifying, and I, I guess what, what did stand out to me is that it's not as, as graphic from a horror standpoint as you might think. It's, it's much more psychological. And that's the type of horror film that I prefer is a psychological horror film because I feel like, you know, that is a movie that will stay with you. That is a movie that when you turn off the lights at night to, to, to go to sleep is going to still be in your head. And maybe you want to turn the light back on and read a book to ch kind of change the, change the sort of hamster wheel uh, spinning around in your head 
about about a movie, and that's when I know a movie is is really good is when I can't stop thinking about it. Most unfortunately, a lot of films that I see, I'll see one time, and and they're fairly forgettable. You know, they're they're sort of that middle ground. It's the ones that are really bad or really exceptional are the ones that stand out in my memory. There's another class of movies I I think that like almost require a second viewing in order to fully experience them. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, The movie Memento, Christopher Nolan's second feature film starring Guy Pearce is a movie that upon second viewing, you'll you'll notice all the details that you missed. And, And so that one really, really left an impression on me. Another film, I would say Darren Aronofsky's The Fountain. It's not one that's brought up too often, um, but that film really, really left an impression upon me. I think Darren Aronofsky is a brilliant filmmaker, and The Fountain is another one that I believe you can appreciate more upon second viewing because you have things happening in different time periods, kind of that that are uh, uh, reflecting or echoing each other, so to speak. So, I do think that in addition to movies you may only see once, I think that movies that that require a second viewing to to gain more from it, I think are are, are really important to explore.